So my sense of purpose was attached to the uniform. So if I didn't have it, I didn't have purpose. Because the platform was the only way I could be a hero. I needed a war. Welcome to another episode of the NSP. On this episode, I had the opportunity to chat with someone I'd never met before, Farid Yaghini. A Canadian born in Iran immediately following the Islamic Revolution, he immigrated with his family to Canada after being smuggled out of the country at seven years old. His formative years were spent in Toronto before joining the army. During most of his time in uniform, he was focused on applying his linguistic and cultural skills to support both conventional and special operations in Afghanistan. When it was time to hang up the uniform, he went through some soul searching to find his new purpose. In addition to an increased focus on fatherhood, Farid founded Camp Aftermath, a year-long program that helps active and retired military and first responders develop the mindset and skills to manage operational stress injuries and post-traumatic stress disorder through volunteerism and the development of positive habits. As you will experience, Farid is a dynamic and passionate guy with a genuine desire to continue to serve. Without further delay, here's my conversation with Farid Yaghini. Farid, uh, thanks so much for joining me today on uh, on the NSP. It's uh, it's great to meet you, and uh, thanks for welcoming me into your home. Honored to be here. Why don't we uh, Why don't we kick things off, and uh, and you can give the listeners a little bit of a a sense of your family background, uh, and you know when and why perhaps that your your family uh, ended up coming to Canada from Iran. So uh, I was born in Iran, and probably like the worst year you could be born, 1980, which was a year after the Islamic Revolution. So there was a lot of chaos going on, and at the same time, uh, there was a war with Iraq. Um, and on top of that, uh, I was wrong religion, wrong country, because I was not uh, a Muslim in Iran, and this was an Islamic Revolution. So for anyone that wasn't Muslim uh, at, during that time, it was rather trying time, um, you know, uh, compared to kind of ethnic cleansing, if you will, um, uh, th- that's been, uh, has been occurred in other parts of the world. So my family, after, uh, seven years of enduring that, um, and, you know, multiple people in our family were, uh, arrested and, and some were executed, uh, we, uh, decided to escape. So my parents basically, without telling me, of course, I was a kid back then, uh, I was seven years old, so they didn't want me to go tell my friends that were, you know, planning to make the mad dash. Uh, but, uh, we said our goodbyes. I jumped on a train thinking this is the coolest thing ever, but I was wondering why is everyone crying at the train station? And that's because we were going to the border of Pakistan and, uh, where we'd be smuggled, uh, into Pakistan. Um, and, uh, so that trip was unique in the sense of, because the smugglers, uh, broke up the family. So if we got caught, not all of us would be executed at the same time. Uh, so we, I was separated from my family and then, uh, we met about a week and a half, two weeks later in Pakistan. Uh, now some might say this is a very traumatic experience, but as a seven year old, little snot, like I was just having a great time <laughs> because I was in the back of a pickup in a, in a desert with smugglers and I got to touch guns. And, you know, I just thought this was the coolest thing. I, I had never understood the gravity of the situation. I think my cousins who were older than me, uh, suffered more from this experience because they actually knew what was happening. Whereas I was just like, I think I was disappointed when I saw my dad. I'm like, damn it, rules. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so Order has been restored. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, uh, we spent two years in Pakistan under UN protection. So that's why we went to, um, uh, Pakistan. Cause at that time UN was providing refugees, uh, protection. Um, and, uh, we stayed there for two years and we got our paperwork sorted out to come to Canada, to immigrate to Canada. Uh, the time in Pakistan was, you know, stressful for my family. But again, I, I was so young. I was just running around, getting chased by stray dogs and, and, and learning uh, English uh, at, a, at a local school nearby. Um, I started to miss my family, but I didn't really understand. Like, I just thought we were going to go back home eventually. I just thought this was like a, a trip away. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Um, from there, we came to Canada in 1989. And uh, so that was my, that's how we ended up in Canada. Yeah. And what did your parents tell you about, you know, the, the train ride living in Pakistan, if you had this sort of sense that, well, we're going to go home at some point? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it was mostly they were trying to protect me. So uh, they were trying to protect themselves, obviously, in Iran, if they would have leaked that information in school thinking, hey, we're going to escape. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, I think we would have been probably arrested or executed because 
It was a weird situation where the Islamic Republic didn't didn't want you there, but at the same time, they didn't want you to leave, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like they wanted to just uh, kind of terminate the people or convert them uh, type thing. So um, for that reason, they never told me anything. Uh, but when we got to Pakistan, again, like um, I was with uncles and cousins. So there was that kind of, you know, at least I had that little bit of community. Um, and it didn't seem real because we were in transitory situation. We were moving, you know what I mean? It wasn't final. It just felt like a long extended summer vacation you mm. know, uh, somewhere. Um, and they just told me we're going to Canada and we had an uncle in Canada. So that's why we chose Canada because one of my dad's brothers was already here. He had established a life here before the revolution. He had come here for his studies, I believe. So, um, it was just a kind of a field trip feel to it as a, as a, as a nine year old, as a, as a seven to nine year old during this escape. What were the living conditions like in Pakistan? Are you living in a UN facility of some sort? Like how? No. So they would, uh, they made arrangements for like a compound. Um, so it was like a compound with a yard uh, and had uh, two open spaces where we all slept on the ground, like each family. So my, my uncle's family and, and, and mine, we slept okay. in there. That I know it seems kind of unique to Canadians listening, but uh, in Iran, like even though we had a house and everything, like they sleep on the ground, like the beds are. It wasn't that we couldn't afford it; it's just people all sleep as a family usually in, in okay. a room. So again, the culture shock wasn't there for me. I wasn't like the food was definitely different. <laughs> okay, right? like it was much spicier. Um, I knew I was somewhere different, but at the same time, I, again, I think my age saved me. Like I was jumping on the bank at you know, donkey carts and just disappearing to markets, you know, and just having fun with the situation. Um, I think my parents did a good job uh, sheltering me from from that. And I had my cousins there as well. What, uh, I mean, I think we see a lot of this in, uh, whether it be through, you know, Hollywood's representation or actually news stories about sort of the, the prohibitive costs of being, of being smuggled from one country to another. Uh, was that the the case in the yeah, situation? Yeah. So we, like my family definitely spent everything they had to pay the smugglers um, type thing. Because I remember even as, as I as I grew up, I thought we did some 007 techniques to get across the border. But then when I actually thought about it, I think we just drove up to the gate <laughs> and gave the guy a bag of money. So um, yeah, we definitely, they spent everything they had to escape. Uh, we, we came with next to nothing when we arrived in Canada. Um, but and, and then of course we were supported uh, when we got here, uh, and then luckily for my dad and, you know, and his brothers and they were, they got together and they, they, they started, uh, various business ventures to try to get themselves out of it. And, and they built a life from scratch, incredibly hard, you know what I mean? Uh, incredibly challenging, but other than living, let's just say in cockroach infested buildings outside of Toronto for, uh, for a couple of years, like I never really, I can't tell you that I went without food or shelter. Like that was always there for me. So you came in 89. I came in 89. Yeah. And whereabouts in the GTA did you? you live? Um, so that we first uh, started in a town outside of uh, Toronto. We did a little bit of time in Scarborough, but then we moved out to a town called Whitby. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, that's where we lived for, well, geez, like a, a, probably like 15, 20 years. 10 years of those was in this project, you know, government uh, subsidized housing uh, buildings uh, called White Oaks. Okay. So imagine four high rise building outside a town, mostly filled with low income, mostly refugees and immigrants myself. And that's where I made my friends. That's where I met my, you know, my first Canadian friends, which honestly, I'll be honest, I didn't, I don't think I saw many white people in my first 10 years in Canada <laughs> because I'm just like, this is Canada. Like it's like Africans and Somalians and Jamaicans. Like it was just so diverse. And you got to understand in Iran, there's no people that like travel there for tourism. So I had never seen right. anyone yeah. of any different culture. Like even in Pakistan, like they're a bit darker than Iranians, but they kind of look like, you know what I mean? Like it's not, it wasn't as diverse as seeing, for example, like uh, someone from Africa. Like I had friends from Sierra Leone. I had friends from Ghana. Like it was, uh, it was a really unique experience for me. Uh, so kid. was that the apartment buildings and then that was fed a, a, the school you went to as so well? So the school so. I went to, again, was very much kind of uh, immigrant investors. So that's where I kind of, but the thing is when you grow up in those neighborhoods, 
when you grow up as I believe when you grow up as a kid and you have less than when you're kind of you, you could consider like, you know, relative poverty, not absolute poverty, relative poverty. So we were fed and clothes, but we didn't have nice clothes. We came from this kind of ghettoish, if you will. You didn't make friends with them. I was almost had low self-esteem to talk to anyone from the middle class. Hmm. Like I had to walk through middle class neighborhoods and I was just like, wow, what are these homes? Like, you know, because I, I spend most of my time in those buildings and there though we all grew up innocent as kids, I was nine years old. As we got into high school, whatnot, my, you know, uh, my, the kids there, I always had a mom and a dad, right. That took care of me. And I feared, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, a lot of my friends growing up in those neighbors had a mom or a dad who worked multiple jobs to pay rent. So they were just running wild. So as I got into high school, they got into drugs, they got into, you know, uh, crime and whatnot. Now, I never not did those things because I was fearing the police, because I saw how my friends as juvies, they just got away with stuff, right? Even if they got caught, it wasn't mm. that big of a deal. I feared my father, <laughs> right? And I didn't want to disappoint my mom. So um, it was this weird situation where I had low self-esteem, though, because I wasn't, I wasn't fitting in with the middle class. I didn't feel like, you know, and, you know, kids are kids, right? They made fun of us because we were from those neighborhoods and, you know, um, they... Rarely did anyone from the middle class go to those neighborhoods unless, unless they were looking to pick up drugs. Like that's the only reason why anyone from the middle class would go to those buildings right? to pick up, uh, pick up their drugs, if you will, or any kind of illicit activity. So that was my first like 10 years uh, in Canada was, was those buildings. Um, I made great friends. Um, but then as we got older, the gap got different. Like I knew what they were doing was wrong, um, but I just didn't have anyone else. Right. And these were the kids who were responsible right. for me to learn English, to dress, you know, cool, talk to girls, everything I learned from them. Mm -hmm. uh, because my parents were like just starting from scratch. They're so busy. Um, but then you're kind of lost in the middle where I wasn't like gangster enough to be fully in with them. But then I wasn't like an, you know, an academic or, or religious enough to be part of the Iranian. So I was just kind of this kid lost in the middle. Didn't really fit in with either group. Uh, type thing and you know I, I'm honestly incredibly blessed like um, to have not been arrested or something just by hanging around some of them right like imagine when I go to my friend's house to play video games and there's crack being sold at a house mm -hmm. and every one of those times the cops kick down the door I just not happen not to be there now imagine if you're a police officer and you kick down the door and this one kid is like, I'm just playing video games. Like, you know, would you believe that kid? Right. right. And that could have um, changed the trajectory of my life with regards to the military and everything I accomplished afterwards. So just really lucky. Uh, Was there a point at which um, you started looking at you know, wanting to do something different Yeah. Or what was going to happen after high school was, you know, what were the influence of your parents on that? Or was this something that was self-generated saying, I, I, this is not going to work for. Yeah. So that's a very good question. I mean, I was a, I was an epic failure as far as to my, to my, my, my family, because, you know, in, in, in our culture in the Middle East, I think most immigrant families, either you're a doctor, engineer, or you're like a, you know, a, a, a homeless basically, right? Those are your options, right? So I wasn't as academically inclined as some of my cousins who got PhDs, masters, whatnot. Um, I was a little bit more of a hands-on guy. Um, so um, I knew I needed to get away from that neighborhood. Um, because at that, after like mid high school, my friends were making a lot of money illegally. Right. And I was this kid that's trying to do the right thing. I didn't, you know, and at that point, you know, the threshold was low, not having a criminal record. I was like a saint, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so, um, so I, I stuck it out through high school. I honestly, high school football really saved me uh, sports. I, 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 and, and I think this is one of the things that led me to the military is that the sense of tribe, because I didn't have that, right? Because I didn't fully belong to the criminal world, but I didn't fully belong to the academic and religious world. And then so sports kind of helped me. Um, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew I needed to get away. So at that point, I made the decision of, you know, at that, you know, the tech was booming, I think, in the 90s, right? Like Nortel was huge. Everything was mm. huge. Yeah. So... I'm like, okay, like, um, let's do, uh, let's do something in the tech world. So, um, I signed up on purpose to go away uh, to Peterborough, which is a town about 45 minutes away. Mm -hmm. Um, kind of like the boonies, if you will, at the time. Right. And just to study, um, uh, telephony systems, electronic engineering type thing. So, and that was, I think after, you know, 10 years in Canada, that's the first time I got to see 
like went beyond the borders of Oshawa or like Oakville. Cause I, you know, when you grow up in Toronto, it's like an Island. It's like, you know what I mean? You don't get off on the other side. Big, big Island. Away. Right. Yeah. But it's like the world doesn't exist beyond these buildings. Really. Right. My whole Canada experience was these four buildings. Hmm. We didn't travel anywhere. We didn't have the economic situations to travel anywhere. So when I got to Peterborough and I saw like, let's be honest, right? Like, you know, just average, wholesome, you know, middle-class people who drank beer, had barbecues, you know, talked openly about having nice things and not think about getting robbed. You know what I mean? Like just mm-hmm. normal people. It was just such a, I'm like, wow. Like, and I just really polarized things for me because I used to think it was normal that, you know, the cops were raiding my buildings twice a week or, you know, the criminal stuff that was happening and the drama and the, and then whatnot. So that was a huge deal for me was going to Peterborough to study at Sir Sanford Fleming College. And uh, so I did that for three years. And the more I experienced that just like life, that, that normal, I guess, if you want to call it life, the more I'm like, damn, this is crazy. Like, this is not normal. This is, uh, this is not something I want to be part of long term. But there was that sense of loyalty to these friends mm. because they were everything I had. And I still had that insecurity of these people in college who were my friends were like, what if they find out where I come from? What if they find out I'm from those buildings? Because I lied. I just said, I, you know what I mean? I would lie about where I'm from because a lot of those guys were like from rural, like Northern Ontario, right? So Peterborough was like the biggest town they've been to. So mm-hmm. they didn't really understand like, you know, projects and high rise buildings and all that stuff. So I would just basically kind of act, um, Again, not belonging. The sense of be- not belonging is continuing now into my, like, you know, 20s, uh, if you will. So that was huge for me. Uh, and again, you go back to not having a tribe because then you come here, you got to act, you know, gangster enough to fit in with your friends and the gap is growing. And then in, in, in school, I'm also having to lie and be a different person, pretending like I had a house to live in, pretending, you know, my parents had a barbecue. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Like... And these things that, you know, the average middle class does uh, type thing. So, yeah, it was, it was definitely, oddly enough, the, the challenging time people, when they, li- when they think about my life, they think it was escape in Iran, but it was actually in Canada in, the, in that transition piece. Um, because I, I, I say this to a lot of like immigrants at first generation. Yeah, you live in Canada, but when you step into that house, you're back in Iran the culture, the language, expectations. Mm. So it's like I never literally let, I was, you're stuck in the middle. You're like this hybrid where you have to act Canadian when you go to school and you hang around people, but then you got to act Iranian when you go inside that house because that house is full on Iran. Right. Like, you know what I mean? The decorations, the furniture, like everything was Iranian. I, I No, I, I guess I don't know what you mean. I mean, I can... <laughs> I can intellectually, I hear what you're saying, but I can't imagine what that feeling is like. And and, I mean, did that feeling ever go away or is it? Yes. And that's where the army came in. Yeah. Yeah. So after I finished school, I go back. I'm like, I did everything right. No criminal record. I got post-secondary education, (laughs) the tech world. And of course, I think the year before I uh, graduated, the tech world burst. Nortel went down. Everything went to hell. Right. And I was just like, so I go back home. Now I got like, you know, 20, 30 K worth of student debt and I'm back in my parents' basement. I got no money. I think I was a cable guy for Rogers, (laughs) right? That's what I studied three years for. Right. And now my friends have just like taken it to another level. Now they've graduated, for example, out of like weed to like crack and cocaine. So they're making like real money and I'm in debt. And I'm like, I got to ask my mom for like gas money. Do you know what I mean? It's just like, like, what's going on here? What am I doing wrong? The what world seems I, upside down. Right? Like, I'm doing yeah. everything you ask me to. What, what, what's going on, right? And I made the very dangerous promise to myself. I remember at that point, uh, I was painting the outside of these mansions on Young Street. You know what I mean? Working under the table. The guy wouldn't even pay me. It was just horrible. Like, on this wobbly ladder, right? And you just watch the gap between those buildings and these homes. And you're just like, I'm never going to get there this way. I'm not going to get there. So maybe my friends are right. And this dangerous thought came to me that if for another year or two, I do this right thing and it doesn't work out, then, then screw it. I'm going to do the drug thing. I'm going to do the criminal thing. Cause honestly, I could do it way better than them. 
like I was sober while doing it, <laughs> right? Because right. right, these guys were just running around, like just acting like idiots and somehow not getting caught. And it was a very, I think about it, it was like, how ridiculous is that promise? But as a 22 year old or 21 year old, I was just like, screw it, this sucks. Everyone else is getting paid. I'm just like, you know, and I want to support my family. I see my mom and my dad struggling, right? Struggling and I can't help, right? As the eldest son, obviously, of my, um, of my family, I have two younger sisters. I wasn't doing anything to support, mm. right? Um, so that, that weighed heavily on me. And, uh, and then, you know, the military came along, right? They, I, had, I had applied. No, they had reached out to me through my college, right? And I filled out some application. I forgot about it, right? I was just trying to get a job anywhere in the tech world. Like they specifically reached out to you? Or uh, maybe the whole group, the whole group okay, type so thing, right? Sort of recruit, exactly. Recruiting, recruiting the, through like the, the spam yeah. email came through and just said, hey, if you're still interested, blah, 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 right. right? And I'm like, okay. And I replied and I didn't even have a cell phone at the time. They called the guy I was working for. They're like, ah, it's like free there. And a week later, I was on Young Street. There's a recruitment office on Young Street. And I had no idea about that. Now, you got to understand. Young and Shepherd. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Young and Shepherd, yeah. right? It's that red building. Um, you got to understand, coming from a, a third world country, most people don't, don't think about joining the army. First of all, you're forced to. And the other thing, the military is not like, it's not, people don't like the military because the military is pointed inwards, right? right? It's not outwards like our nations, right? Mm-hmm. The military is like how the... The dictatorship keeps its power, right? right? So it's not like no one's going to be proud of you for joining the army, right? <laughs> right? It's a conscription mostly, right? Unless you're like, you know, on another level. But so I was just like the army and usually died when you joined the army, right? Like because you went to a war with Iraq, which was like fought World War One or Two style, right? Mm-hmm. It was like trenches and using tanks as artillery, basically. Right. So uh, blowing whistles and all that other stuff. Um, so... I was like, okay, like, you know, let's just go have a chat. And I went there and I'll never forget this person, uh, Captain Howard, you know, at the recruitment office, right? Okay. He sits me down. And now when I think of it, it was like a conveyor belt, right? So he sits me down. He's like, okay, so you got post-secondary? I'm like, yeah, I do. He's like, okay, you're going to get your corporals and a signing bonus. I'm like, what's a corporals? <laughs> right? He's just like, shut up, right? right? And then, so I signed, uh, I signed the paperwork and then I'm like, he's like, okay, which element do you want to go to? I'm like, element? He's just like, do you want to fly or do you want to work on aircraft? I'm like, no. Right. He's like, do you want to be on the water? I'm like, hell no. He's like, and then he used the most, you know, used line, do you like camping? Right. <laughs> right? And almost with a sinister smile, he's just like, yeah, the army's for you. I'm like, okay, the army's for me. And I went in for, I thought was an info session. And I literally left with like, you know, go do these aptitude and medical tests and whatever and come back in two weeks. I didn't tell anybody, right? Mm. I was just like, oh, just Jesus, like what the hell just happened, right? Like I was in there for an hour. I'm like, you know what I mean? Like, so I did the test. I, I passed everything, I guess. And I went back and um, I still hadn't told anybody. And then, you know, you go in there and then um, there was another captain there, which was really weird. Captain Howard. Oh, no. Captain Howard was there. He took me and I went to that. I did my Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. And, you know, everyone else had their families there, right? I was just there with Captain Howard because I didn't tell anybody yet. Because I didn't know. You know what I mean? Like, mm. who the hell escapes from a war? This is like post-September 11th now, right? Like, who escapes from... This is 2002. And... Okay you know, escapes a war from the Middle East and my dumb ass is going to jump back on a plane to go, right? Uh, type thing. So I was really like, I, you know, again, I didn't want, I didn't tell anybody. So Captain Howard was always there for me. He stood by, like, you know, he shook my hand. And then he goes, okay, so 18 August, this is like June. And 18 August, he goes, within a month, he's like, okay, like, come back. You're going to go to this place called St. Jean. You're going to do your basic training. And then you'll go report directly to CFP Petawawa. I'm like, where's CFB Petawawa? He's just, just like, just shut up. Like, don't, you know, don't, <laughs> don't ask. Don't worry right? about it. Yeah. And what's hilarious about this, when I look back, about two weeks later, I got called back into the office and Captain Howard wasn't there. And there was this Air Force guy, nothing against Air Force people that are listening, by the way. And he's like, yeah, by the way, you're not getting the incentive. Your marks weren't like high enough because it was like a B grade average. And I'm like, oh, he's like, yeah, so you're going to go as a private and like, whatever. I'm like, I'm like, I need to get the hell out of Toronto. So I'm like, yeah, sure, whatever. Like, I didn't consult, I didn't question it. I'm like, right. I just saw it on a dotted line, and I went. And, 
And I went to basic training. I report to basic training. I'm assuming your parents know at this point. Oh, yeah. 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 Sorry. <laughs> I fast forward there. So I went back about a, about once I signed that document, it was about two weeks ago, I told my parents and yeah, my dad was not happy. Like, he's just like, what the hell? You know what I mean? Like, we, you're going to get yourself killed. You know what I mean? Like, I did all this to get you here to this country. We did, you risked all of our lives so you can get an education, you know? And he's just like, this is, this is, you're an idiot, right? Like, so it didn't go well. Um, and uh, my mom, like, she was just, she just thought I was going to instantly die. They actually took a mugshot of me because that's what they did in Iran when you went to war because you know it was like your funeral picture. Okay, <laughs> but I'm like, no, it's not like that. Like you know, like it's so I didn't even know if I was going to go to Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. Like I'm just going to be a tech. My I, my whole plan was to serve my three year contract, get the experience, pay off some of my student loans, and then come back to Toronto, right, and be around my family. That was my goal. That was my my. So intent. It, was a, it was a way out of Toronto. Yes. And it was a way to, to pay some bills. Yes. And I support my family, right? right? Like I just wanted to help. And um, and then that's all my intent was. So I thought that's the way it was going to plan out. So anyways, they didn't take it well, um, let's just say. Um, I show up to basic and uh, honestly, like basic sleep deprivation was probably the biggest thing. Uh, that hard, but all the whole yelling and disappointing people, I was kind of used to that, <laughs> right? Like that wasn't really like, uh, that wasn't like, I'm going to quit because someone's yelling at me. And cause I've been doing that my whole life. I got like a PhD in that at that time. Right. So, but it was just like the sleep deprivation that kind of was, I'm like, Oh my God. Right. Cause I was your typical like guy sleeping in like, you know, um, and I felt this belonging. Uh, I felt the sense of belonging. Like I, this is the first time where I'm experiencing, belonging to someone, you know, those exercises that take groups, you know, marching, all the stuff that you do as a group. This is the first time I felt tribe, Hmm. right? This is the first time I felt tribe. And I'm just like, this is amazing. I belong. I belong somewhere. As chaotic as it is, right? It's a crazy stories that that, that come with it. But I I just felt a sense of belonging. And I remember the only person that supported me, um, you know, my grandfather and joining the military. And he was in Iran at the time. He's passed away since, but he was a military man by choice in the, in the Shah's military. So in the, in the secular era before the revolution. Mm-hmm. And he was a career guy. You know, he, uh, he retired uh, at the rank of uh, major, I believe, or whatever. Uh, and he, he, I, I love my dad, but he was like a stoic guy. He was, he was your tall, square jawed, you know what I mean? Had a sword, you know what I mean? That the Shah had given to him. I always looked up to him, right? And he said something to me that, you know, it's on my skin as a tattoo now. It says, earn it. Right, earn. When we used to speak to him from Iran, he always said, "Earn it." Now, I think he just meant pay your taxes and be a good citizen. I don't think he said jump join the military. But I always I hung on to that, right? And I always wanted to do him proud. And he was the only one. He wasn't happy I joined the army, but he didn't like crap on me either, right? Mm. He just like you know you're gonna learn a lot. This is gonna shape you. You know, he actually said positive things. So I always hung on to his words when things got tough. Um. And yeah, and I, and I finished, and, I, and as I'm, this, this comes back fully to Captain Howard. I hope he's listening to this. Uh, and Captain Howard calls me like the second night before graduation. He's like, oh my God, why did you sign that document? Signing away your corporals and whatever. I'm like, I don't know. Like, it, was just, it was some dude with some stripes on his shoulders, right? He's like, no, you're back on. You're getting your corporals. You're going to Petawawa. Everything's back on. So he actually had to look me up and, you know, I don't know what he did, but I'll never forget that because he changed the whole trajectory of my military career hmm. because I didn't go to Kingston for the training, poet training and all that other right. stuff. I went right to CFP Petawawa. So I graduated basic training. Everyone else got a week off or a couple of days off or and to report to wherever their training is going to be, where I had to wake up at four in the morning and uh, I got dropped off uh, by bus in front of the, in front of uh, CFV Petawawa in my CFs holding barrack boxes, <laughs> which was the, and wearing my rucksack. So on a Friday afternoon, um, and I, and I, and I proceeded to walk in, I was supposed to uh, report into to our CHA. Okay. Uh, and, um, second uh, Royal Horse Artillery. I'm walking past the front gate. And if those who have been to CFE Petawawa, there's a building to your left. When you come in, it's S-111. So that's where all the leadership and the brigade, I, I believe, hang out. And then someone's like, soldier, just yells at me, right? And it's the most amount of ranks, I've bars I've seen across the chest. I think it was like a full colonel. And I'm just like, oh, my God. You know what I mean? My braids all messed up. I'm sweating in my, you know, tunic and my, my rucksack and my barrett boxes. 
Anyways, he just nodded his head. He got me his driver to drop me at the shack, said Tour CHA. Um, and there my time with Tour CHA started. And then, so that tribe then just gets even more fortified. Mm. I met friends there that I'm still friends with now. I was young and naive, so I would do a lot of things that, that the tech world would not do. Like they say, who wants to go on a knife course? I'd be like, uh, I do. You know what I mean? Like, so I was doing all these courses, which normally techs wouldn't. So they, they kind of grew fond of me because I do all the courses and I would be dumb enough, you know, who wants to go on a helicopter ride? I'd put my hand up, <laughs> right? And next, you know, I like, I'm doing like light infantry <laughs> attack or something like that as a tech. I have no business doing <laughs> lugging around a C6 or something. Um, so I was, I was a sucker for punishment. I just wanted to please. I just wanted to earn as my grandfather said, mm. I just wanted to earn. So I would just say yes to everything. The impact of uh, of Captain Howard is 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 pretty impressive, right? And I absolutely, think, yeah. I think a lot of people don't don't appreciate that. You know, you you can as an individual make a significant impact on somebody's somebody's life, somebody's career, and the fact that he then tracked you down to make sure that I you don't were taken have care a of. teacher like in high school. I can say changed me. I'm not saying I'm knocking anything, but Captain Howard is definitely if, if is the person that shaped and subject made me believe in the military even when things went, you know, obviously it doesn't go perfect all the time. Mm -hmm. His, what he did for me, it, it, that's something I hung on to. Like as, as, as if you were to be pissed off at the military for a posting or for whatever happens, right? I always hung on to him. I don't know. Like he, he just impacted me at such a, such a, such a cool way, such a good way. And for him to track me down, you're right. Like, you know, it, it's a numbers game. I'm a, how many people go through that yeah. recruit uh, center? Absolutely. Um, that's amazing. Yeah. So it, it was huge. And then I met more people like that in Petawawa. So as much as like, you know, field stuff there is and the, and the hardships you experience, like there's, there's more time, the more hardship I experienced, the more, they were not all, but I would say 90% of the leaders at 2RCHA at my time were just amazing. Um, you know, rest his soul, uh, Sergeant Major Lazat, uh, you know, he, he played such an integral part in my career, like another person that like, you know, uh, at the time of Warren Hoagie, Moyer, uh, these are all like people who shaped me, you know, they would, they were all artillery guys, but they would just pluck me out of the tech world and they would get me to do, you know, army stuff. Here's how you pack your rucksack. Here's mm -hmm. how, you know what I mean? Like they were just, they just kind of adopted me into their, into their artillery, even though I was just a, supposed to be a tech, right? So early on, I wasn't doing my job really. Uh, and then of course, Roto Zero Afghanistan happens. And Roto, I don't know, 13, 14 Bosnia happens. All so is this a, a, a Kabul or is this a... Kabul. This is Roto Zero. Okay. So this is Petawawa deploying. This is... Um, so like two, the whole base was empty because they all went either to Bosnia or they went to right. uh, Afghanistan. And I was deemed too green still to deploy, which okay. broke my heart, right? I was only in sure. like, two years at the time, right? Barely two years in the army and... So I get it, right? So they all deployed and uh, it was the worst feeling in the world. It was the absolute worst, worst, worst feeling in the world. Like, um, because it's like you train, you train, you train to do something. And then when it's time to go, like, why am I not good to go? Right? So, um, and then, but out of that kind of pain uh, came the opportunity. This email came out from, because there was no CanSoftCom at the time. So um, our Canadian Special Forces put out an email saying, hey, who speaks Farsi, Dari, or, or Pashto uh, mm -hmm. for linguistic support? So that email came to me. I, I did some tests. Um, and uh, mind you, the tests were in Farsi, which is hilarious because I was going to be used to speak Dari, which is not the exact same thing. <laughs> but anyways, um, I probably shows you how culturally unaware we were. Yeah, I think uh, everyone was just scrambling to get like get resources on board. But so I did a test with a Farsi speaking guy. I'm like, wow, this sounds I've never been to Afghanistan before. Right. So I'm like, this sounds very close to Dari sounds very close to Farsi. Right. Mm. This should be OK. So I did the test, and next thing you know, I was set to deploy for Roto-1 uh, with the Van Dus. So uh, a couple of months later, I was shipped out to Valcartier, uh, and I was uh, supposed to be um, attached to our um, the ASIC, the All Source Intelligence Center, so providing linguistic support for various units uh, right. there. And so I met my, my, I met my kind of, you know, uh, my team in Valcartier like the night before we uh, flew out. Basically. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the same thing. I show up on Valcarte. I've never been there before, you know, with my rucksack and my bear boxes again at another brigade and no one knows who I am. Right. 
And I don't know if they're open anymore. They put me in these shacks. Their shacks are in a bunker of some sort in Valcartier. Yeah, uh, there's a there's an old sort of uh, Cold War era bunker there. Yeah, I've seen there as well. Yeah, so yeah. I, I I was all alone in there. There was no one else oh. in there. And now I hear they close it down because of asbestos or something. I don't know. But like, uh, so I I, I spent a couple of nights in there alone. I just had a meal card, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, sounds about right. And then yeah, and I did my first roto um, in Kabul in Camp Julian. Beautiful camp. Like it was just so well put together. Um, and uh, I had an amazing tour, uh, semi-adopted by our Canadian Special Forces to run some of the operations. A lot of time outside the wire. And Kabul at that time, you got to understand, is not overly, like we had lost some people, but it wasn't like, it wasn't Kandahar, mm-hmm. right? So our presence outside, foot patrols, all those things um, were there. I had, a, at the time, Colonel Tremblay uh, was the one in charge of, of uh, Camp Julian. Okay. And um, he was like a badass. So he would be always on foot patrol and he wouldn't have a pistol. He would have like a freaking bayonet strapped to his leg. You know what I mean? He's just a badass. And, and so he was always like doing crazy foot patrols at night, day. And I was kind of his linguist, like, linguist basically at the front. So I spent a lot of time outside the wire, which I loved, right? I loved. Uh, the dairy language I had to learn on the fly. Uh, it's a variant. There's a, it's a variant of Farsi, if you okay. will. So I kind of picked that up through trial. Um, uh, and, and, and some of the more like, you know, funnier ways, you know what I mean? Um, uh, and, uh, but I picked it up. I was surrounded by the, and I worked with closely with the Afghan soldiers. I, you know, they were all very interested in me. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, wow. Like, you know, cause who are you? You know what I mean? Like how long, you know, I remember one of them asking, how long does it take to drive to Canada? I'm like, it, there, there's a, there's an ocean. Like, you know what I mean? Like, but like, you know what I mean? It was like, sure. it was like that much of a, of, of a disconnect there. And, uh, so yeah, we were, I worked closely. I had an amazing tour. You know, one of the impactful moments for me was, um, a patrol who had picked up a, a, a little girl, uh, who had a heart condition and she looked like a vampire had like just drained all her blood. And this stayed with me um, uh, for a while, which will come back to these moments. But these were one of the one of like uh, one of my major moments, which really uh, hung out. I, I hung on to, and the patrol brought her back to Camp Julian, and then I had to provide linguistic support and with the father and like what's what's going on, and the father's like, you know, it's typical. Please help, please help. She's dying, whatever, and. I guess long story short, the family, some of the family members of soldiers sponsored this child and uh, her and her family got flown out to Canada. I don't know how this was made to happen. And it was a very simple one day surgery, some sort of a valve in the heart. Okay. She came back a month later, three weeks later, and I got to greet her and she looked like a normal 10 year old girl, nine year old girl. And you're just like, fuck, that's awesome. Right? Like right. you got to be a part of that. Like you wear that flag on your shoulder and it didn't have to result in anyone being hurt. It wasn't like an operation. It was a. Re- it was just simply kindness, right? Um, so that was that was that was a huge moment uh, for me. Um, but the tour with the Van News was very unique too, because you know every brigade has its own culture and differences. So just deploying with them, you know what I mean, was was very unique. Got to meet soldiers that I would probably never meet if it wasn't for that deployment. Uh, overall, amazing experience, um, and I couldn't wait to go back. I extended my tour a couple of months to uh, do a handover. Okay. Um, because I just I just loved it so much. Because I couldn't believe I was getting paid to do this. Again, so you go from belonging, right? And then when you come to Afghanistan, for me, the fact that they really needed me because of the linguistic, and I was I was the only one at the time that was a reg force linguist. Right. So. The when the Jags were signing off on, on operations and going out on operations, they necessarily they don't want to send the civilian or the reservist on the more dangerous ones because it looks bad if those guys get hurt and killed, <laughs> right? <laughs> Whereas if you're a reg force guy, well, you signed up, right? Like, and I kind of get it, right? So, but that worked out so much in my favor because most of the linguists that I met there were reservists from various city centers, right? There couldn't have been a huge pool of no, people either. No. Yeah. So I only remember like, um, uh, two other, uh, Iranians that were linguistics and they're both reservists. Now, mind you, they had signed whatever contract it is that reservists signed to become like a full-time, but at the yeah, end of class the day, C yeah, exactly. contract for yeah. deployment. Yeah. Um, uh, but for, I was the only rec force one. So when the JAG was signing off, it's like free, 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 right. If they knew it was going to be like a hot LZ or mm. something like that. Again, Kabul wasn't that this, this falls in more line for my second deployment. So that was my tour. 
Um, and then I finally come home. Uh, and uh, it was really weird because everything wasn't good enough anymore. Um, what does that mean? Everything? Like, like the exercises didn't mean it as much uh, to me. Right. The garrison stuff, you know, spit shining friggin' labs or, you know, <laughs> putting up tents right. to dry. The regular daily stuff. <laughs> right? Like base. winter warfare while I stare at my apartment lights, you know, from the field. It just didn't mean <laughs> as much, right? Like, yeah. um, and it was just this, like, I just, I just want to go back, right? I just want to go back. And um, again, no cans off comp. So then I get a call about three months after coming back. I get a call into my sergeant's office. Sergeant's like, the phone's for you. I'm like, uh, okay. And it was one of the guys um, that I had deployed with. He's like, hey, man. He's like, do you want to go back on tour? Like, literally, right? I'm Corporal Nobody, right? Mm-hmm. And he's just like, I'm like, uh, yeah, man, I want to go on tour. And then I, he was like, okay, I'll, uh, I'll get back to you. And my sergeant's like, who the hell was that? I'm like, I, don't, I thought you would know. But you know what I mean? Like, if it's coming to me from the sergeant, right? He's, right. Like, he's like, no, I don't know, right? And then anyways, so... Um, I get called into, uh, the CO's office, like literally the next day. And there is the friggin', you know, this tall Sergeant major with his pay stick. They're all like grilling him. He's like, what the hell's going on? Right. It's like, and I, I, I afterwards I realized they're actually trying to protect me. Uh, Cause they're like, do you actually want to go on tour? Cause they thought I was just being kind of like poached, or poached pulled, and then in. pulled into, and I was, yeah, yeah. I was like 23, 24 at the time. So they actually they were protecting me. I thought they were mad at me for going on tour. Right. And they're like, son, do you actually want to go? I'm like, again, so you go back to these amazing leaders, right? That you, you feel like someone's looking out for you. I'm like, yes, sir, I do want to go. They're like, you, know, you kind of explain. Do you understand that your career is supposed to be a tech? And so far with us, you've done nothing but play silly bugger in the field. And now you're going to go hang out with the soft guys. This is affecting your career. I didn't care. I just wanted to be needed. Mm-hmm. I wanted to serve. I wanted to be, you know, there's a sense of like, I wanted to serve. And this was the most optimal platform for me to serve. You know, digging trenches in Petawawa wasn't this, it didn't feel the same anymore, right? Or fixing radios, which I barely did very little, you know what I mean, of. Was that feeling uh, shared as people were doing uh, sort of more deployments into, you know, the Bosnia had wrapped up? Absolutely. Yeah, constantly. Like now all of a sudden the grumblings, you know, the grumblings in the field, like, you know, sitting no sleep and cold was one thing, right? Like, this is stupid. Do you know what I mean? But then those all grumblings got louder and changed to like, we would never dig trenches in Afghanistan. It's so heavily mined. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So why are we doing this World War II stuff, you know? Engage town, like digging, you know, <laughs> trying to, like, you know, create trenches and whatnot. Um, and and yet, yet, we're not going to be doing this in the field. It's a t- it's a t- enduringly tough target to hit because then when you look at what's going on in Ukraine, yeah, it's you know there's elements of it that are more conventional Absolutely. in nature. Absolutely, but who knows yeah. what happens ten years from now and how that shifts again? Right, and I think the, the the message that I got that I hung on to was like you're training to defend your country first, like that's your main. Do you know what I mean? So that was kind of the message that I got because even when we went to Wainwright, I believe uh, when all of Petawawa went to Wainwright, I forget what's like what was that exercise called? It was like two or three. It months. Used to be called Maple Guardian, something like that. Now yeah, it's Maple Resolve. Yeah, Maple Resolve, whatever it was called. It was like we went there in February, left in March. So it was like I was wearing my whites, training to go to Afghanistan, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like it just didn't make any sense, right? Uh, so it was it, it it became challenging to justify the garrison stuff, uh, right? Um, the parades. Mm. Right, all the stuff they didn't have to do, and of course, the more and more I hung around the soft guys, the more my dress and deportment went to hell. Right, like because like I got to grow a beard, you know. You just wore, you know, I wore more civilian in my tours than I did in military uniform, right? Uh, type thing. So it's um, it's one of those things where um, it it really impacted my my garrison life uh, type thing. So from there, I came back and then they asked me to go again and I signed a waiver. I believe I signed some sort of a waiver. Um, and I, 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 I left and, and I was back on tour. This time, uh, again, the soft deployments don't match the, gear, the, the brigade deployments, right? right. They're, they're like four month intervals. They, they're very much different. So um, I, did, you know, I did some workup training. I went there and then we, uh, I was back in Afghanistan and for Roto 4, Roto Zero Kandahar. Um, I believe that's 2004, five-ish, five. Yeah, yeah. Five, yeah, five, five, six. Right. Yeah. So, 
And I got to tell you, like coming back, I've never done this before. I know I, 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 my heart goes out to all those folks that deployed to Bosnia over and over. But man, it was not as good as I thought when you go back to the same base. That didn't feel as good. I'm just like, oh, like, you know what I mean? Like, Did you end up in Julian? Yeah, I ended initially? up in Julian. Yeah. Oh, okay. I ended yeah. up in Julian. I'm like, oh my, I think I even got the same tent, mod tent. I was just like, <laughs> this doesn't feel good, right? <laughs> right? I've heard countless guys say that about Bosnia is that I went back to the exact same sort of ADCO accommodations trailer. Uh, yeah. This is the same bunk I had 18 months, two years ago. Absolutely. And I, I... I, I couldn't, I, I thought this would feel so good to go back, right? But this didn't feel good. And so from there, um, I went on HLTA, I came back. And then when I go to, I was pretty uneventful, my first half of okay. Julian. It was like um, a lot of like operations, but they all went smoothly. No shots fired, just very kind of, you know, presence patrols, a lot of stuff like that, uh, questioning and, 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 and whatnot. Um, one of the things that actually stood out though, I, I want to really highlight was, my first interrogation uh, was with uh, was you uh, was with a boy who they had caught uh, eyeballing our, our armored vehicles, and an American patrol went by there, and then uh, you know an ID went off, and so the next time our boy saw them, they brought him in, uh, type thing, and he was like must have been like twelve or fourteen or something, right? And I'm the linguist on site, so mm-hmm. I'm working with a friend of mine. So, you know, we're questioning him. He's like, dude, I'm just a kid. I see tanks. I like to watch them. He had a little cassette player. And uh, he, uh, you know, he said, I study English in the corner. I listen to English cassettes. And you know, right enough, the cassette was an English course, right? There's like, I proved that. The questioning went on, though. And then he starts crying. And he starts pleading with me in my own language. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you need to save me. Do you know what I mean? You need to help me. I'm like, and I'm just like, my heart's like melting. I'm like, why are we letting this kid go? Right. I was actually questioning, what the hell am I doing here? Right. This guy's, this guy's a kid. Right. So I, it really, I, I went, I went to bed that night. It was like five hours of questioning. Like, you know what I mean? And so my, my, my heart went out for the kid. And I just started thinking, what am I doing here? Right. And I remember showing up the next day and then they found out that in that cassette player actually uh, was a, was a push to talk. So when he was pressing play, he was actually reporting, look, he was pushed to talking. And then you think, oh my God, I'm such an idiot, right? And it was at that pivotal moment, I was told, because obviously the person doing the interrogation really noticed how uncomfortable it was becoming, right? And he's like, you need to leave your heart at home here. You know what I mean? Like we weren't obviously like putting a bag over anyone's head or get mowing them, right? It was just a questioning thing. But obviously you can understand that's a stressful for a 12 to 14 year old kid, right? right? Bunch of soldiers. So you think that's a good happy ending, right? Um, we get, we catch the bad guy, but then he tells us his dad made him do it. So then we bring his dad in. Right. Now you think, okay, the kid goes free and the dad is a bad guy. No, the dad guy has no money and the Taliban paid him five bucks a month or something to do that. And now the father is arrested and now the family is without the only earning income person. And I start to understand and alleviate this idealistic idea of black and white, Right that there is no good guy, bad guy, right? Like it was, and, and it was a huge learning lesson for me. And it, it served me as my deployment transition to Kandahar because I believe I needed to learn that lesson. Uh, I think I would have been a lot, a lot harder for me to endure what I endured in Kandahar when the mission turned to counterinsurgency. So that was one of the major things for my, my rotations in, in Julian was that, was that moment. Um, and another one was, you know, um, Bagram uh, was the major American base yeah. uh, up north. Uh, we used to do um, presence patrols like outside of that. Like it looked like you're on the moon. Like there was just no civilization. You know, you we drive for like hours and hours. And there was, you know, this place looked like so desolate. And then you saw out of nowhere, but we were, we were trying to build school there or something. And I saw a well what the Canadian engineers had built. And I'll never forget this little girl. I still have a picture of her, like uh, a little girl pumping water out of a well. Do you know what I mean? With a Canadian flag on it in the middle of nowhere. And before they had to go like walk like hundreds of kilometers or something to get water. And you're like, how cool is that? Mm. So we have another one of these, what what I call flicker moments, right? So you have the child with the heart. Uh, condition and now you have this well built by Canadian engineers in the middle of nowhere, which never made the news, right? It never made anything, right? 
And I found out later on, like, why aren't we bringing attention to these things? Because whenever we brought attention, whenever the engineers or Canadians um, built a school or a water well, and then we put it in the news, well, the Taliban would then go and burn that thing down. Again, no black and white. So they only hear the bad, oh, casualties, collateral damage, blah, blah, blah. But they don't hear about all these things. And but because we can't tell everyone about these things, because they would go burn it down, right? So that so it is it's a huge lesson to me. Learn one thing to know at an intellectual level; it's another to see it uh, before my eyes. I really hung on to that. So I come back uh, from HLTA uh, from Roto Roto Four. HLTA Kabul. being your sort of your vacation uh, yes, break in the my vacation break in yeah. the middle, and then I came back. And when I go to get out of the plane, they're like, "Stay in. You're gonna you're just gonna go fly straight to Kandahar." I'm like, "Oh." I guess it was a big road move, which I was spared. There was, there was yeah. yeah. So apparently that road move was not fun. I forget how long it took, but it was not fun. And um, I, I got to miss that. I got to just stay on the plane and my team just simply came on to Herc with me. And then we just went to Kandahar. And there, uh, my whole operation, everything about what I was doing uh, was just changed to counterinsurgency. Okay, so you get on a plane, you yeah. head, head south. Yeah, exactly. You're now down in Kandahar, and, and you said things started to, to change significantly because yeah, now so, you're in counterinsurgency. Absolutely. So I landed in, Ka- in Kaf, which is the Kandahar uh, base uh, there, um, and that, that was like a city. That's like makes Camp Julian looks like a, you know, a, a sandbox, basically. Um, I stayed there for about a week. Uh, at the ASIC to figure out what they're going to do with me. Because then again, they're like, this guy must know how to speak Pashto too, because he speaks Farsi. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I don't speak Pashto no. at all, right? So they're like, okay, what are we going to do with this guy? And again, um, so there was there was a, a position um, with a liaisoning with the Afghan Special Forces. So basically, uh, almost about a week and a half in, I was shipped off to Graceland, uh, which was... Uh, Mola Omar's old compound, uh, downtown uh, Kandahar. Uh, it was very close to the PRT there um, uh, for the Canadian bases there. So, uh, uh, and it was this is where uh, all of the American and Canadian special forces were operating out of. Uh, so I was, Graceland was the portion which I stayed in. The whole camp was at that time called Gecko. And when, when was that? This would be... 2000, this is still Roto, end of Roto 4, Roto 0, Kandahar. So I think 2005, 6 type thing. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so I would have been just down the road at the Yeah, PRT exactly. The we discussed time. this. You would have been at yeah. the PRT, which I drove to the PRT a bunch of times on a, on a dry riverbed all the time because that's yeah. what we used to drive there. Down the canal road. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, less IEDs on the riverbeds, <laughs> right? right. <laughs> so um, I never went inside, actually. We just picked people up and dropped people off at the PRT, like VIPs and whatnot. So um, I get, I get, uh, I get, I get to Graceland. I, I've never, I haven't met the squadron there, uh, the special forces squadron. So I'm like completely new. I have no idea. So they come in, you know, they paint my gun. They put a bunch of ga- gadgets on it, which I don't even know what they are. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then, uh, I get treated like one of them, right? Like, um, none of this, like with a 25 round magazine, two rounds in this, like none of that normal conventional military stuff. Now it's like, they just throw ammo at me and them. I'm firing a machine gun off the side of a John Deere, like, you know, four by four or something, right? Like they're just, it's just ridiculous. Like I never experienced that world, right? And they immediately bring me in. They dock me in. Like, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm hanging around, um, you know, it's kind of a weird name nowadays to call an assaulter. I don't think that's, that's even kosher anymore. But, like, you know, I get, I get put in with those guys. I do whatever they do. Uh, and they just... And then again, there is that, there is that huge sense of serving again. Right. And I'm so important to them. They keep saying how important, in fact, in all the scenarios where we practice operations, if something goes sideways, I end up being the VIP. They got to keep the little guy alive. Right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So like I'm in the middle of all this. And so it was really cool. And then there is that sense of constantly, man, I better be good enough. I just don't want to mess up. I don't want to mess up. I don't want to mess up. That's all that was going, right? The way I trained, the way I uh, did everything was like, I don't want to mess up. Everything was at a higher level. Um, and these guys were just a different breed, right? Not to say there's anything against a conventional military. They're just a different breed, right? Like, um, and it's, if they don't go outside the gate, like they'll, you know, They'll fight each other, right? <laughs> right? Like, and I got to work with our seal, the seals. Uh, they were they were attached to us. So 
start doing a lot more counterinsurgency, driving out in the middle of nowhere for extended periods of time, um, just uh, just like doing robust things that the conventional military wouldn't. Even the vehicles, right? The vehicles are not armored, so they chose a different path, right? So they would drive Humvees with no doors, windows, or nothing, but just guns everywhere, but then they would drive on the side of mountains because they're so light. Mm. So then they wouldn't have to drive on the one roll with the IEDs on it, right? So we were basically counting on them being horrible shots <laughs> versus being... IED plant, which worked out in our favor, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Firing from the hip was very common amongst the enemy. So um, I just felt, how can I say this? So very safe in a very unsafe environment, right? Right. Um, I looked at them the way you look at turbulence and you look at the stewardess, right? Mm. I looked at these guys when firefights would happen, right? I I would constantly just, they would just guide me and speak to the same tone of voice that I'm speaking to you in combat situations. Right. And that just made me feel so comfortable um, type thing. So, and it was a, I was, I was a great service. So what I would do then in the field, because we were, there was an Afghan special force element with us at all times. I ended up looking like the Afghan guys and I would go to the door of places that we were planning to kick the doors down on. And I would just simply do it. What's called a soft knock. Like, Hey guys, can we come in? Right. Cause sometimes they would just let you in. There's no need to kick down the door. Right. So, um, I, that was my role, right? And if they wouldn't, if they try to take a shot at us or if they wouldn't open the door, then I would step aside and those guys would do their own knock, type of knock, right? Um, and uh, it, was just, it was just a really cool place to be a liaison within the Afghan special forces and, and the Canadian, right? Um, you, know, you, you know, you have that moment that in World War I, I think, when Christmas, the soldiers from the two sides stopped right. and came in the middle. So I would do that every evening. Where, you know, our ration packs had a, had one packet of tea and one packet of coffee. And then every evening I would grab all the teas from the Canadian uh, soldiers and then all the coffee and I would bring them in the middle. They would exchange their coffees for teas because Afghans don't drink coffee and Canadians don't drink tea, right? So <laughs> it was this big exchange and um, it was, we really bonded with them. Um, you know, the, the Afghan guys were just the mo- some of the most professional soldiers, but I was also very highly emotional and, and, and at times vengeful, right? Because this, the Taliban had done certain things to their family members up north, right? right? So some of the things that they wanted to do while on deployment, like simply could not fly, right? And then so you would kind of have to reel that, you know, to fit in within the box of combat, if you will. So that was very unique. But I was empathetic because the stories they told me of what they had endured, I'd be angry too, uh, type of thing, right? I'm just doing a job. Basically, right? I have a gun. The Taliban's got a gun. We got this ground. We're doing, this is business, right? Whereas I think them, it's a bit different uh, when you lose family and, and God, all sorts of other. I can thoughts. only imagine your childhood made you, made you even more empathetic to, to it or. Absolutely. Did you see it that but, way? but you know what? Like, it, it's funny. Later on, you know, I, I would work as a civilian and, 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 and in the military, in the counterterrorism world. And I always count my blessings for never working on the Iran file, the mm-hmm. country which I came from. Because I never took anything the Taliban did to me or tried to do to me personal. It was kind of like, it's a business, it's war, right? Whereas if I would have gone to Iran, I think I would have took that much more personally, right? Because the family members that were executed, you know, of course, I never wanted to work on a file focused on that country because I saw the effects of it, right? You take things personally and it hurts you, right? Whereas me, I'm just like, man, I got a gun, they got a gun. I'm in their country. You know what I mean? Like it's, mm-hmm. it's business, right? I wasn't emotionally attached. If that makes any sense, um, type thing. So, um, that, that happened. Um, you know, one of the things again, that stuck out to me, if you want to call one of the flickers again, and we'll come back to the reason why I'm mentioning these. Um, we were on a high ground feature with, with the, um, and we were supporting some of the operations going around this high ground, uh, like a big, a big mountain, you want to call it. Right. And uh, on the base or halfway up the base, the mountain, there was a school for girls, right? Just bombed out. It had nothing. It had no roof. It just had a chalk and blackboard. And I saw for two days, I saw, and this is amazing to me, I saw fathers in a very hostile environment. So this is even south of Kandar. We're talking about places like Khakrez and Lom. Like these are very far, like away from Kandahar. This is wild west out here, right? Right. And... Yet these brave fathers were dropping off their daughters at school for girls, even though they were threatened with death. And 
it was just like, you know, I, I, I couldn't help but admire that. Right. And, um, and then the night before we left, usually, you know, whatever supplies that were left over, we would bury your kind of, we, we didn't want to want the enemy to know we were there. So we were, we were only four of us up there and we would just come back to down the mountain, get picked up and get the hell out of there. Um, we ended up going the night before and dropping off just whatever we had, like food and, you know, whatever supplies we had left over. Cause we didn't know how long we we're going to be up there. So we had always more than we thought we were going to need. And, uh, I got to watch the girls in the morning come to school through my scope. And I got to see, they were just so fucking happy. You know what I mean? It was just like stale bread from your ration pack. You know what I mean? And some like, you know, paper and pen or whatever we had. Right. And I always hung on to that. Right. Like it was again, another moment where you got to do something nice and it wasn't, you didn't have to hurt a bad guy, arrest anyone. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You just got to do something so it's good. A, something human. Something human, right? Yeah. And I always think about that because, you know, when I when I would talk to my Reg Force friends, you know, in combat units, they would be like, okay, son, protect this road. There's a hospital being down the road at the end of this road. So you protect that road and he would fight for that road and he might lose friends to that road or he might lo- civilians might die in protecting that road. But then he never got to see the hospital. He never got to see the look in the patient's eyes. He never got to see any of that. And that's not the army's fault. That's simply you have to go to another road, right? But he was robbed of this, that moment, which I got to have. Mm. He was robbed of the moment I got in Kabul with the kid with the heart. He was robbed of the moment of the, of the water well because he simply had to move on or she had to move on to the next road, to the next operation. I think it was my serendipity or maybe because of my job uh, and, and perhaps working with the, you know, special forces that have much more robust rules <laughs> that, um, that I got to see that. Right. And it really something that I hung on to, uh, type thing. So from there, I, I got really comfortable with being uncomfortable, uh, in the field, uh, again, be just being around those guys. Right. And then we were, uh, something unique happened, uh, was that, you know, usually when we go on operation, we would practice on something called the kill house over and over and over and over. Like, so Freed knows exactly what to do. Right. Uh, and, and then we got woken up in the middle of the night and then, you know, that said there was some intel that there's someone important, very important that never crosses the border from Pakistan as, you know, in this certain area. And we need to go now. This has never happened to Freed before. Right. So I'm just like, oh my God. Right. So we get ready. We're on the tarmac, and then uh, usually all operations happen at night because these, this unit always uh, is outnumbered, right? So they usually go in and out before morning prayers happen. Those were usually how we uh, did night operations. And um, we sat on the tarmac, and then the helicopters never came. So we're like, okay, well, the sun's up. I can hear the morning prayers. Hmm. Let's go for breakfast. We're starting breakfast, and all of a sudden they're like, go, 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 right? The helicopters are coming. So this person was deemed important enough Um that we were going to do this during the day, right? Just the, the commander had given, okay. you know. So two Chinooks. Um, I was in a Chinook with uh, uh, one side of the Chinook Canadians. You know, of course, it's an, it's an aisle, right, seating. Uh, we had one, one on one side, I was with the Afghan Special Forces, and the other side was the Canadian. And the second Chinook was filled with Navy SEALs and Canadian Special Forces. Two Chinooks, two Apaches escorting these Chinooks. Chinooks obviously being like the bus, the buses of, right. <laughs> they're pretty slow, right? Yeah. So uh, easy targets, but uh, the Apaches would provide uh, that kind of uh, support. Um, this is my first time doing this op in this way with Chinooks. Usually we just drove on, drive, drove on okay. site. This is my first time gotcha. doing an infill with, with, a, with a Chinook. So I didn't know how Americans test their weapons, but they're not like us. They actually shoot them. <laughs> so as soon as we took off, the helicopter leans to the right. And I'm, I'm supposed to be sitting in the back. This is a very important point, actually. I was supposed to be sitting in the back of the Chinook with my friends, like uh, close buddies of mine. The last second, the captain's like, hey, I want you to sit up front with me. So I'm sitting right behind the pilots beside the gunner. To my right is the gunner um, with a, you know, a high caliber machine gun, which I don't know what it was, but it was loud. So the helicopter leans to the right and this guy just starts firing. And I'm like, oh my God, we're taking fire. You know what I mean? But it was just a guy testing his gun, right? And I'm like, oh my God. So I'm kind of like nervous on edge. Um, we got two rows of people. And then we have these four by fours in the middle of the Chinook with guns mounted on them that they were going to drive out of the Chinook, I guess. And as it was only a 15 minute ride. Um, it was in Uruzgan province, uh, which is not too far from Kandahar. Um, and we were driving and uh I kind of, we get the, we get the whole, like, they're making up LZs in the captain's making the LZs on the sky, which has never happened before, right? Before we were like 
doing this, uh, practicing, practicing, practicing. Mm-hmm. We knew exactly what was happening. And then we get the whole like, you know, like uh, two minutes out. Everyone gets to two minutes out. We're starting to come kind of, you can feel the descent. And all of a sudden the gunner really starts pointing his gun left and right, like erratically. He's not shooting, but I'm like, I guess that's normal. Like I've never been an info. He's probably just looking for enemy. And then I just went deaf because he started firing. My right side, because it was just so loud. I just went completely deaf. And, um, and what felt like was stones being thrown at the helicopter, but those were rounds coming up. Um, uh, so um, the intel had said that there was only um, approximately 10 to 20 like uh, high value uh, force, but because they were trying to keep a small signature, there was only going to be 10 to 20 of them. And their uh, support element was going to be like about five clicks away. So the idea would be come in, we land, we overwhelming force, we take the bad guy before the like their QRF right. would be able to arrive on site. Um, this was kind of wrong. Uh, there was like hundreds of them there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? And um, so, I mean, of course, it's not perfect. This is not knocking. It's just war. It, it's, uh, it happens all the time, I guess. But we landed. Uh, anyways, and then so all of a sudden, I look to the... Um, I looked at a pilot like you do again, a stewardess in turbulence. And he's like, this is a shed LZ, you know? And I'm like, oh, okay. And uh, all of a sudden I feel this heat on the left side of my face, like someone had opened the oven door. Hmm. And I look to my left and the tail is gone. And it was just like, whoa. And in hindsight, we saw, uh, you know, the, the video from above and, and they showed that it was like three, four RPGs and the last one hit the tail type thing. So where the ramp would be in the Chinook was just like an open f- hole on fire. Okay. Uh, and I'm like, that can't be good. You know what I mean? And then all of a sudden the helicopter just like really tilted forward, uh, sharply. And then everyone fell on top of me because obviously I'm sitting at the front. Everyone from the back just fell on all this kit. Everything fell on top of me. And I remember thinking, I'm like, oh my God, all this training, this cool beard, all this uniform. And I'm not even going to get to like, you don't do anything. I'm going to, right. I, and I wrote it down. I'm like, not like this. That was like, it's funny what, what a 24 year old thinks when, you know, we don't have kids or, or right. a dog or anything to think about. All I could think of is like, I got this cool beard. I got this painted gun and I even got the shot. You know what I mean? I didn't get to shoot a rifle. So everyone falls on top of me. And then there was like this kind of abrupt, like thought, and I guess the helicopter, what the pilot did, whether on purpose or instinct or whatnot, it kind of crashed it to the side of the mountain and it kind of slid down. Very okay. and, and unlike the movies, it didn't explode. So then everyone gets out of the back of the helicopter. Um, they get off of me. And for whatever reason, I decide to, I saw an open hatch where the gunner was, right? That, that hatch. And I threw myself out of that hatch. And I fell down with my rifle stuck underneath me. Uh, and I look up and I just saw feet in sandals. I'm like, oh, crap. And I look up. It's an old man with a pitchfork. We had landed on someone's farm. And he's just as scared as I am because he probably just thought a UFO just landed no on him. No kidding. His, yeah, right? Like, yeah. And then I'm like, am I going to get pitchforked to death? Right? Like, that was my thing, right? Like, how embarrassing would that be, right? <laughs> right? So, anyways, if you just made eye contact forever until someone starts yelling at me to, you know, uh, get away from the helicopter because it's still on fire. So we go muster up, uh, you know, away from the helicopter. We're in a very horrible spot now because the enemy's got the high ground and we're on the bottom of the valley, uh, basically. Um, and again, these guys spoke to me in the same tone of voice as you're speaking to me. Um, so what happened was they called in. The Apaches basically unloaded uh, whatever they had on, uh, on a mountain nearest to us. And then just to keep the enemy's head down. And then we basically kind of took uh, high ground so we could be in a more advantageous uh, state. Um, and I can say that I outran, uh, you know, our special forces up the mountain only because I was way more scared than them. <laughs> I, because I had to do that walk a couple of times in the, in the next five days we were stuck there. And I was like, oh my God, every five f- steps I had to stop to catch my breath. But because I was just so much more scared than them, I believe I like, I, I'm like, eee! They just outround him right up the mountain there. I think it was supposed to be a section attack, but Freed didn't hear that part. He just like, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, I'm just so new to this, right? Um, there, um, you know, where I was supposed to sit on that Chinook, uh, that's where everyone got hurt. Uh, one of our members was shot three times um, and uh, basically like uh, in his right butt cheek and it went into his abdomen. 
So he was brought up. A couple of Afghan guys were scraped up, and two of the other guys, our special forces, were um, were uh, shot, but like shrapnel, like you know, the the bullet didn't stay inside or whatnot. And there was shrapnel, and they chose not to get out because they did an uh, they did an emergency medevac where the helicopter okay. just kind of hovers yeah. and you throw the bodies in, if you will. So because uh, they couldn't stop uh, the uh, because they would just get shot down again. There was an overwhelming enemy force there. It was like 150, 200 of them there. Mm. And uh, it was basically a beehive like that we just kind of stirred up there. And so um, it was very unique. That's the first time I seen someone shot. Um, and I remember the medic, I was helping the medic. Uh, there was this Israeli gauze, a, a blood clogging Israeli. And I was, he was, he was holding it because he was holding his the IV with one hand and I was pushing in the gauze into the bullet wounds. And I remember thinking he's okay. He's not bleeding. Because of course all the bleeding was internal. Yeah. But in my, in Freed's little mind, it's like, he's not bleeding. He's going to be fine. He's going to be fine. And um, yeah. And then they basically threw him on a Chinook, uh, sorry, on a, on a Black Hawk uh, out. And the biggest joke was because he basically, his only his upper torso was in the helicopter. So he kind of mooned the Taliban as he took off. <laughs> but he, um, an amazing story. He went to Germany. He made it to Germany at, the, at that hospital that we have. The uh, Landstuhl. Yeah, it's a very sophisticated uh, hospital. Yeah, U- U.S. Uh, military hospital. Yeah. So um, he made it there and he was two months, uh, they split him right down the middle and he was wide open to, for the swelling of his organs to come down. He survived. Wow. And, uh, and then a couple, I believe a year or two later, he was, a, he was an assaulter again, which shows a testament of these soldiers mm. uh, to their craft. So we were stuck there for five days uh, and we would go up and down um, uh, basically because they couldn't send more Chinooks to pick us up because they, would, they were too slow. They would get shot down as well. So the uh, Australian special forces who were posted in Ruzgan, they tried to break through. Uh, I believe they lost someone in their attempt. Um, so they were kept at bay. Um, so then the American Air Force basically stacked all, uh, all Air Force operations stopped in Afghanistan and they stacked aircraft above our heads every thousand feet. So it was Apaches. Then there was the A-10s, which were those, you know, those planes, um, anti-tank planes, I believe. Then you had the British Harriers. And then on top of that, you had the, the Spectre gunship, which is basically a transport, you know, helicopter uh, plane with like artillery on the left side. Right. So they just went to town on these guys for five days. Um, Cause these people, they wanted us because this is right before operation red wings uh, where the Navy seals were shot down in those two Chinooks. Um, okay. uh, Lone survivor was the movie they yeah, made out of it. Right? right. So this was the QRF that was going exactly, to Exactly. So it. this was the kind of same deal they want. They knew we were special forces there. They wanted to jump on the helicopter propellers and, you know, say right. we did this right so they knew they had numbers on us so they kept trying to push through the aircraft so the fighting honestly the 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 real you want to call it close quarter but uh it was you know a mountain away type fighting that that ended within the first day because then the aircraft just kept them at bay um so that 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 went on for five days uh until enough of those guys died and by the way, the guy who we were after ended up, uh, the Spectre gunship picked him up trying to like leave in a, group, in a convoy of like suburbans. <laughs> okay. So it was, it was, it wasn't as bad as it sounds just because of the people I was with, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't acknowledge again what was happening just because I was around people that were just joking and using humor the whole time. Like, you know, like I remember one of the Navy SEAL guys I had to come friends with. He goes, hey, Free, this is my lucky rabbit foot. I'm like, oh, cool, man. We survived. He's like, yeah, this is my fourth helicopter crash. I'm like, get that thing away from me, right? Like, that's not lucky, right? So humor was always used as a way, you know what I mean? And I connected with that, right? I connected with that. And the fifth, honestly, the scariest part about that whole operation was when we finally, the American uh, 101st Airborne, Mm -hmm. um, they finally broke through the lines. Okay. uh, And then they took the high ground and the Chinooks came and picked us up. Um, And the scariest part of this whole operation was getting Chinook out. Because the gunners were super nervous and they were just firing rounds into the side of the mountains just to keep the enemy's head down. But like, to me, I don't know what they're shooting at, right? right? So I'm just thinking, oh God, like this is another, that 15 minute helicopter was the worst ride of my life. You know what I mean? Because, um, because you were just shot down in one of these damn things and then you're getting back on, right? And the, right. Guy, the guy's just firing away again. And but you, you know, and you lose your situational awareness. Oh, of course. You're in a tin can. Because now you're in a, yeah, yeah, you're in a tin can. And you know, you're just trying to play cool because everyone else is just like, you know, 
got their like you know game face on and i'm just like trying to pretend i'm cool but inside i'm like get me out of this thing you know what I mean? <laughs> right um so that was like kind of the i i think the next couple nights back on base were rough for me uh every you know any slightest noise anything would kind of like wake me up because i thought i had to go back on another op mm. Do you know what i mean um and what happened was about four or five days later they're like we we're going out back on operation like that's how these guys work right they have they had to go on a presence patrol three-day presence patrol i think they're like do you want to go and the sergeant major i'll never forget right captain howard type person right do you want to go and of course i said yes because i don't want to let them down but inside no <laughs> right like mm. i'm i'm scared like honestly i was i, I don't know um so i said yes and I slept better those three days in the middle of the desert than in a secure camp. It was just, it's mind boggling. It's just like that whole scenario where you got to get back in the car if you have a car accident or yeah. thing. And I believe that like, that served me, that served me a lot. Just because it was just ego and a sense of duty that wanted me to go back out, right? It wasn't because I wanted to. And nothing happened on that presence patrol. Like it was a, you know, um, it wasn't, there was no combat in it. But it was still outside the wire, you know, playing in the enemy's backyard, basically. Um, and I think that was huge for me. And then as my tour came to an end, um, and one of the things there, there was the, the, the surgeon, the sergeant major for uh, the special forces at the time called me to his office. And again, I've been so blessed with amazing leadership. Um, he goes, no one's going to give a shit about what you did here. No one other than the people who did it with you. And that's not to say that, that they're, they're bad people, but don't go back to garrison in Petawawa, pump with your chest pumped out. Do you know what I mean? With dip and like your Oakleys thinking you're better than anyone else. No one's going to give a shit about what you've done here. Mm -hmm. And at first I was just like, oh man, like, come on. Like, you know, why well, you got to be like that, right? Like, this is pretty cool, right? <laughs> and then, but it, and I understood why he did that. Because I think that saved me from when I went back the second time that um, there wasn't that sense of emptiness it was anymore, right? I just, like those words hung true for mm. me that garrison, there's a lot to be learned as well. And, and honestly, like I talk about my tours, but I did 10 years in the military. Only what one year of them was deployed, right? The rest of it was amazing people and friends in garrison in Canada type thing, right? Um, so yeah, so that was my, my deployments to Afghanistan. I came back. And at that point, I had a girlfriend. We're talking about having a family. And then they're like, well, we want you to go back. Uh, oh, they're like, we want to go back. Do you want to sign another waiver and go back? And I'm like, can I, can I take a break? Like, can I not go? Because at this point, I was thinking about a family and whatnot. They're like, yeah, sure thing. And then a uh, very unique military. But then you're going to get posted to um, CFS Leitrim in Ottawa. You're going to go on a language course to learn Pashto for your future deployments to Kandahar. At the Astiku Center, which was a, a language training school, I believe, yeah. back in the day. Mm -hmm. So I spent a year at Astiku Center, and I and then I served in the capacity of uh, providing support to our special forces, you know, from abroad, right, uh, through electronic means. And uh, you know, I had a very unique career because, like, you know, when people know they're going to get promoted, they they're told they have an idea. There's rankings. I was told to go do your medical. I'm like, well, why am I sick? What's going on? What'd you guys find? And he's just like, no, you're getting promoted. I'm like, oh, can I see my NPRR? Like, where's my career manager, right? <laughs> They're like, just shut up, right? <laughs> and then so, and even the posting, right? Like you would know for a, a year, I think, or at least several months, you're going to get posted somewhere, right? There'd be posting season, all that stuff. With me, it's just like, nah, and like next week, like show up, like, you know, at, at a Siku center. Like, right. I mean, I live in the shacks. I owned a Canex pullout and a, and a, and a television. So, I'm just like the travel light. I remember the moving guy showing up with like, you know, the big tra transport truck. He's just like, yeah, is, is this that it? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so I ended up uh, spending uh, the next uh, four and a half years uh, at Leitrim. Um, and then um, a different army, a different army, I sure. must say. Uh, I have to say what's expected of a junior rank at Leitrim is a lot more than at one at CFP Petawawa. But also the military ethos, dress and deportment also is not the same. It, it kind of, I was very surprised. You know, while I was in Padawa, I was always kind of like, I always hated being treated like a kid. Someone telling me your button was undone or your boots were not shiny enough or you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Whereas when I went to Ottawa, all of a sudden I'm the guy that cares, you know, a senior NCO is like walking around with coffee with his beret in his pocket and buttons undone, right? I'm like, well, when did I turn into this guy, right? What happened to me, right? It's funny, huh? 
And um, so that was, so it was good though. Like I, it was, it was different army. As I say, it was a different army. And then they asked me to deploy again. It was time to go back to Kandahar. My languages was up and everything. And, um, and it was the first time where, you know, I, I said no, because I, as much as I love being with the special forces, uh, and as much as I wanted to be everything like them, but I also saw the price that I think not everyone gets to pay. Uh, I saw the, the, the trouble at home and I saw people looking in ultrasound of an unborn child after that helicopter crash. Mm. And I didn't know if I was ready to pay that price. Um, I was scared because you think you want something so bad. And now all of a sudden, you know, like, do I want to? Because they're all like, dude, you should just try to go through selection. You're already doing it anyways, right? And uh, there's no guarantee I'm going to make it, obviously. Just because I did tours with them doesn't mean I'm going to survive hell week. And, um, but it was just, uh, it was just very scary when you find out you don't want what you thought you wanted. You know what I mean? It, it was, so I said no to a deployment and they were not even angry about it. They're like, yeah, sure. Just keep supporting us. But for me, that was the beginning of the end of my military career. I didn't join the army to say no to deployments. That's not why I joined. I'm not knocking anybody else, right? There's a lot of great people that support the Canadian military just from Canada. But that's not why I joined. And it just, it broke me inside. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I uh, at that point, I was uh, working uh, closely with a government agency doing the same thing as what they do in Leitrim. So uh, they were going to post one. And once I said no to that, they wanted to post, promote me to sergeant and uh, go back to CFP Petawawa. So the idea of going back to a base as a senior NCO with a job that I haven't touched a radio. Right. So, and all these stories that I've told you, it's so spanning 10 years and I haven't touched one radio. <laughs> right. So it just didn't feel right. And uh, so I chose to retire in, in 2011. Uh, and, uh, from and I became a civilian uh, working with the government agency doing the same thing basically in that electronic world still supporting the mission as a civilian still supporting the same missions doing the same things but just not in my green pajamas anymore right mm -hmm. um, and I thought that was just going to be seamless because I had worked in this agency as an integree I knew the civilians I thought this was going to be easy but it wasn't uh, and in came this huge um year or two of my life where it was this complete sense of emptiness. Uh, and I didn't know why. And I actually thought that was like, you know, PTSD and all these other things at the time. So I actually went in and, um, um, my marriage was kind of falling apart at this point. Not, uh, and I'm, I have a great relationship with my, my ex-wife. Uh, but at the time it was just falling apart because it was a lack of purpose. Right. So after the kind of looking into it, um, what I didn't realize is that the military provided me with a platform to serve my purpose. So my sense of purpose was attached to the uniform. So if I didn't have it, I didn't have purpose because the platform was the only way I could be a hero. I needed a war. If there's no war, I can't, I'm not, I'm not useful. The idea of living a life and, and paying a mortgage and, and, you know, spending time with family was just, it was like garrison. It was empty. At that point, of course, I didn't have a child. I didn't have any meaning. So at that point, I think a greater part of my life, which I can say now openly and freely I wanted that glorious death in Afghanistan. I never wanted to make it out. I wanted to mean something. I wanted to, I wanted to live out what my grandfather asked me to. I wanted to earn it, right? Mm -hmm. What greater way to pay back this great country by making the ultimate sacrifice? I, you know, obviously romanticized this at that age because I didn't have any attachments. I didn't even own an animal. You know what I mean? Like I, yeah. I had nothing. I had the shacks and I had deployments. And that's, so I didn't want to just be some guy that came here, died of a heart attack or, do you know what I mean? Got hit by a bus or something. That's, that was what was going on in Freed's like 24 to 27 year old mind at the time. Um, so I'm like, geez, this is, this is, this is crap, right? This, I felt like I was lost. And if he would have told the refugee Freed that he was going to be married to a beautiful girl living in a house with granite countertops, a motorcycle, you know what I mean? He would have said, damn, you won the lottery. And here I was the most sad and miserable I've been in my whole life. Um, so then I became, you know, uh, at that point, some of my friends were starting to uh, suffer from PTSD, mental health issues. I became part of a, a panel, an unofficial study, I guess, you know, why are you kind of half decent? <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay. What's going on? And then, you know, though I did suffer from certain things, it wasn't that acute. 
Um, is this being run through the military or yes, a university? Yes, through the military. Okay. Through the military yeah. uh, and, uh, and it was basically come to an understanding. At first they thought because I came from a war-torn country, like maybe that, that because it was a somewhat conditioned, and like, no, that's completely uh, out, you know, ridiculous. But the other thing that they found out was that I really hung out to those moments, the kid with the water well, the kid that we got to do surgery in Canada with, right? Or, or those schoolgirls. There's five of these moments, right? These flickers that the mental health professionals called them. For whatever reason, my mind had anchored to them. And all the other chaos that happened, right? The stuff that happens in war, my mind chose to, or I chose to subconsciously, hang on to those moments. Like I hang on to Captain Howard. Mm. Like I hang on to, you know, Sergeant Major Lazat. I hang on to these things and I don't know why, but I hang on to them more so than all the other stuff, right? Um, I'm like, cool, okay, right? I didn't really understand what that meant. Uh, but then, as, then I, when I was, uh, you know, uh, eventually my marriage came to an end. I had a three-year-old daughter. Uh, we were good, but we just simply grew apart. It was, it was, it was, a, it was a very a kind of a systematic separation with my ex-wife. We are raising a beautiful girl now uh, together, uh, and it's awesome. I, I, lo I love uh, both of them dearly. You know what I mean? Uh, and what happened was that I came to the realization of my, if all my friends are now, because the wars come to an end, right? But of course it's, it's all the, all the mental health issues comes as soon as the wars ended because they're not, you're not going back. You're not going back. Right. So now all of a sudden there's this, this, you know, people are like, you know, hurting themselves. Uh, there's, it's all over the media. So I'm like, man, what's being done for my friends? So I went and volunteered and I, and I found out what's being done for my friends and amazing things are being done for them. They're going, you know, they got access to medication, doctors, they're going to retreats, you know, fly fishing, petting horses, climbing mountains. So what's the problem? When I asked them, right, when I looked into it, when I volunteered at these places, the fact is that none of them had a follow up. So it was an experiential, like you went and you did a thing and it felt great, but then you went back home and then you had to jump to the next retreat. Right. Right. And then you have to take the next pill. You have to see another shrink. Right. Type thing. So it's that follow up piece. And also none of them provided purpose. They provided just like peace from the pain, not purpose. Right. A reprieve for a small. Exactly. Of time. And my, this is my opinion, obviously. Yeah. Right. Um, because no, no one replaces the uniform. Right. We were all told we were special. Right. Because we were soldiers and those were civilians. So we are, we were, we were told we were special and they had to tell us that to justify the things that we were going to do. I'm not talking about combat. I'm talking about missing anniversaries and birthdays. It's okay. You're a soldier. This is the price you pay. Those are civilians, almost like sheep, if you will. Right. But then no one's there on the other end to bring you off that pedestal when you become a civilian. No one's there to tell you that, yeah, just go and be a great dad. And that's your purpose. Mm. That's good enough. Right. You don't need to go freaking end insurgency, right? Or in Afghanistan or whatever, right? You can just be a good, wholesome dad or a brother or a cousin. Those all have purpose, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm like, oh, that, that, that's a gap. There's a gap there, right? So what can I do? I thought to myself, well, if those flickers that I got to have in Afghanistan saved me, why can't I recreate that, right? Of course, I was too scared. I kept this to myself. You know, who the hell am I to talk about the topic? Luckily, I was blessed to be around enough, a lot of good friends and family, and they supported me. And uh, so I wrote every single mental health expert I could find in Canada, uh, like all the universities, any article I could find, anything. And then one of them came across Dr. John J. Whalen, who's a veteran himself and, you know, as, a, as an author and a mental health professional. So he's like, yeah, you think you might be on something, right? And he goes, well, what do you want to do? So I'm like... I want to, at that time, I was going a lot to Costa Rica. Uh, Costa okay. Rica is a, is a, you could consider it a third world country. Uh, ironic, it abolished its military in 1948, spent all the money on healthcare education. There are only like 7 million people, so it works for them, right? Okay. Um, I love that country. You don't feel like a tourist there, right? It's not like you're holding your Mai Tai and everyone's starving around you, right? It's more integrated, right? There's no all-inclusive kind of there, mostly, right? So, and... I came up with this idea. I'm like, why don't we go get flicker moments for the veterans in Costa Rica, where I love Costa Rica. There's, the Nicaraguan refugees lived in a, in, a, in a ghetto called La Carpio, which I knew about, right? So I found a sister charity in Costa Rica. And I, the idea was that I would take veterans there to 
create those flicker moments. So we would do volunteerism in Costa Rica, okay. but not build a home and leave. Do exactly what I got. Build a home with the community. Look into their eyes as I got to look in their eyes. And then Dr. Whalen put structure around it. So broken down to three phases, right? So we create, we call it camp aftermath. I came up with the name aftermath because it's in the aftermath of the military, right? Um, so we called the camp aftermath and basically, you know, there's three phases and it's a one year program, right? So not experiential. So the first phase is screening and suitability. This is not an addictions or, uh, or, uh, you know, suicide prevention program. These are people who are kind of at a certain state. We do the screening with our mental health professionals and phase two is the volunteers in peace. We went to Costa Rica and we build a home for a, for an old lady who's supporting her family and had stomach cancer. So we did that for a bunch of rotations. We built this home and then we built additions and we built other things for, for the family. And then we would go to an animal sanctuary. We would give to animals and then we would go to a, a, do reforestation. The idea is that we give and then which one of these realms do you enjoy most giving to? And then when you come to Canada, we would help them enroll in charities in Canada to recreate the platform. Mm. To rec- so you can make your own platform. Right. You don't need a war. To serve. Right, 100%. Right? Um, and then we followed up with them for one year. This is the most important phase. So for one year, once a week, we would meet on a VTC, a video teleconference. And because, you know, we want to set goals. Because a lot of these guys will come back from Costa Rica. They want to grow a man bun, move to Tibet, and become a yoga instructor, right? So it's like, we want to kind of like re- really break that down into like smart goals, if you will, right? Like, how about you go for a walk twice a week, right? Like, <laughs> date your wife, maybe, right? Yeah. So um, we... We break it down and then had really positive effects, right? And then it ended up being that only like I would say 50% uh, of the people engaged in volunteerism. But what the idea of volunteerism is when you do it, then you create empathy with everyone else. You find a, find that a, the kid who lost both his parents uh, to cancer, the little, bit of the, the little brother program. Right. You see the trauma that's in just civilian life that people have to, you know, and we signed up to go to war. I signed up to go. This kid never signed up for that, but he's still sticking around. Right. So you start to see and you get to connect with them because they got their own story, which we never got to hear because we were soldiers in a base. Right. And then it connects you with the same society, which you feel isolated from. Like what do all, what do, what is the most common thing said when you're talking to a soldier? Like they don't understand. They just don't understand. Right. But now when you go volunteer, whether it's at the you know, homeless shelter or the big brother, little girl, uh, sister program, you do understand. They do understand because they went through stuff, too. It's not to disregard your trauma. It's just to know everyone's going through something. And, but they never signed up to go to war. And then what Dr. Whalen has also brought to the attention was that who were you before you became a soldier? It's not just about Afghanistan. That's not where PTSD came. That's where the symptoms came out. So if you and I were from the same area, right? You came from a wholesome home and your mom and dad fought, but they also resolved conflict, right? And you grew up with that nucleus. You knew what love was and you knew how to talk your problems out. But I came from a household of, you know, a broken home, alcoholism and all these other things. We both go to Afghanistan. We go through that helicopter crash. Who do you think is going to have more resilience when they come back home? Right. So then we address that as well. Right. And of course, that's not the job of Camp Aftermath. But then you become a better patient for your mental health professional because then you're not just talking about Afghanistan. You're talking about perhaps with me. Right. I just never belonged. I was just never good enough for everything. I just thought the army was this idealistic thing, this thing that was, you know, no man left behind. But then when you retire. Like, that's it. Right. Like I, when I left the special forces supporting them, I'm only in contact with one of those people that were dear friends. You know what I mean? Because it's their job doesn't allow them to be, you know, telling me about where they went, what they're doing. You know what I mean? All of a sudden, the thing that kept us together is not there anymore. Yeah. You're, you're, you're stepping off the bus. The bus you keeps are. going. The bus keeps going. That's very, like, and that's the perfect way to say it, right? The green machine just keeps going, yeah, it right? it just keeps rolling on. But you're made to feel when you join, you had this idealistic view of the military that they would never leave you, that you finally, you know, and the, and the people who come from troubled backgrounds drink that Kool-Aid the hardest, right? Like when you don't belong anywhere, the military becomes your everything, and then when they don't live up to this expectation that you have in your mind, and that's that sanctuary trauma, as Dr. Whalen calls it, right? Then then home, then you're just like everyone else. You're like everyone else, right? 
that you're just going to leave me mm. type thing. So I think we saw it on the dotted line at a very young age, right? And then you begin to think. So that's something that we try to address, right? That like the thing in Afghanistan was a thing that happened. We're not here to compare trauma stories. Oh, you were in a helicopter crash? Well, I survived an IED attack, right? That's not the place. Right. It's like, what are you doing now to come out of it and share your story with others, right? And also what volunteerism does is just kind of helps you not have only army friends, <laughs> <laughs> right? So you're just not sitting there yep. talking about the good oil. Like you just... This idea of that the best version of this is I'm I'm I was to this too that the best ver, the best version of me was in the past, like that the coolest thing that happened to me was that that surviving that helicopter crash and fighting my way out of it. Yeah, it's that is uh, it. It may seem trivial uh, to some people, but that is not easy to get yourself out of that uh, yeah. that cycle of just talking about. People say work, but like you said, I mean, it's more than work being in service in that way. Uh, so trying to break out of that cycle and have a wider group of friends, a wider group of interests yeah. away from something that's dominated your life for so long. Yeah, is, identity, I think. Yeah, yeah I it's, said, it's identity. And then that comes, you know, I had, a, I had a seamless retirement because I just just went into a job that I was already doing just as a civilian, right? Mm -hmm. I can't even imagine if you had to leave because of mental or physical issues and now you're like... I guess I'll be a mechanic. Do you know what I mean? Like, I can't even imagine that, right? Where I, I had, I was so blessed. Do you know what I mean? I, I'm so blessed in all aspects. I got to ride off into the sunset with my military career, right? Like, and uh, I always say that. And I think maybe, you know, sometimes they say, you know, I was in the military at the right time because of my linguistic capabilities, right? And I was just dumb enough to say yes to everything, right? <laughs> but like, um, I was just, yeah, I, I just count. I just didn't want to do that. So then we did that in Costa Rica over and over and over. And then the COVID and the pandemic happened. And then we moved it to Canada. Uh, and now we do it in uh, Northern Quebec for a charity uh, helping uh, support uh, children and adults with autism. So we go there, we do projects there. And then we do the same thing, three phases. We do workshops. And then above and beyond that, as I was supporting that, you got to be careful because, and I'm lucky enough to be around Dr. Whalen. He always goes, don't let anyone put you on a pedestal. Right, because then this this then camp aftermath becomes my new uniform, mm. right? So uh, that that took work too, right? That this is not my thing. I'm still a father, right? And then above and beyond that, I took a course on wellness coaching, uh, and because because I wanted to be a better support of the mental health professionals. But then what was serendipitous about that is that in that coaching program, I got to work with civilians for the first time in that capacity, and it just opened my eyes and I only, I started my own organization called quantum wellness. And from there, now I'm working with civilians and military and I find it so amazingly fruitful and rewarding. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, everyone could use this. Everyone has gone through something, right? It's not just this one time in Afghanistan stories, right? Um, so it really has expanded my horizon. I think what I found that my thing in the military was always to serve, Right. And I think for most soldiers, when they leave, you need to fight to get your platform. Because you see in the army, I never had to fight for the platform. You want to go on deployment? You want to go on training? You know what I mean? They dressed me, my underwear was, you know what I mean? My socks, everything. They provided the platform all the time. But when I got out, those first two years, I just wanted someone to give me a war. Like, why isn't anyone telling me, you know what I mean? And I had to fight to find camp aftermath that, you know, fight to do, have be brave to do quantum wellness, to put myself out there. Right. And I think that's the one thing, if I had any advice for soldiers who are like transitioning out for whatever reason is that like, there is a price to pay for becoming a civilian, just like there was a price to pay become a, but I think if you know when the price is, it's easier to handle. And then you have to fight to have purpose. The purpose is not going to get served to you in a platform anymore. There's no one, you know, no crusty sergeant major running you up and down the hill to get fitter anymore. Like, it's just you, right? Like, you got to go to the gym on your own, right? And, uh, and I think that's been my biggest takeaway uh, is that I have to do this myself now. I normally end the podcast by asking, uh, you know, if you have a, a recommendation for listeners to, uh, that can educate, entertain, or, or maybe elevate a cause. But I think... I think you've done an amazing job of elevating Camp Aftermath and and some of the the work you're doing. Uh, so I think that's I think we've we've already given that recommendation to the listener. 
I really just want to thank you for, for sharing your story and, uh, and taking time today for let, allowing me into your home to, to have this discussion. So thank you so much. It's been an honor. You can find information in the show notes on Iran's Islamic Revolution, counterinsurgency in Afghanistan, Camp Aftermath, and Farid's newest initiative, Quantum Wellness. Thanks for listening to the NSP, and goodbye until next time.